Welcome to the fourth in the Inspire series of interviews. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. David Bull, an OF, a medical doctor, a passionate campaigner, and an award-winning television presenter. David, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Louise, and welcome to Brandeston. So, David, um, tell me, how, how is lockdown life for you? Um, I think like for most people, it's been absolutely extraordinary. You know, we've been expected to sit at home, completely change what we're doing. And as someone who is self-employed, then my business has pretty much imploded because I spend a lot of time doing medical conferences, big events abroad and lots of television. And of course, a lot of that's been cancelled. So my income has fallen off a cliff. On the upside, however, the General Medical Council has given me my licence to practice medicine back again because I'm part of that army of retired physicians who is sort of ready and willing and able to go back and assist the front line. And I have to tell you, hot off the press, I've just had my letter for a sort of um, to put me back into the front line here in Suffolk. Fantastic. So when is that going to start? Well, I think I have to go through a number of checks and we have to go and work out uh, a strategy. But pretty soon, I would suggest. And actually, one of the biggest things about this, and I've argued for a long time on television, one of the upsides, I think, could be that we get a sort of dad's army of of medics, of reti recently retired medics, and those people who are who have medical training, so they're able to come back and sort of uh, form that voluntary reserve force. So it's pretty exciting and terrifying all at the same time. Yeah, but do you think society as a whole is going to change as a result of, of all of this? Once we get through it, are we gonna learn some significant lessons from it all? I hope so. I think we've seen a lot of humanity around it. You know, I've seen people talking to their neighbours, which certainly didn't happen in the past. I've seen people caring for the elderly and the vulnerable. And that's been really lovely to watch. The fact is, we are looking out for each other. The fact that we applaud the NHS every week, I think people realise that the NHS is an integral part of our lives. And also, I think one other thing that's really struck people is that money doesn't buy you happiness. You know, people have money, but they can't do anything with it. And maybe those simple pleasures like going out for a walk or a swim or spending time with family will sort of take on more meaning. Yeah, yeah that's certainly the sense I get from the conversations I'm having as well. What um, of everything, um, when we get through this, what will be one of the first things that you will do? Well, it's my birthday in two days, so I'm pretty miserable. I'm going to be spending that on my own. <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to do is get out and have a bit of a party, I think. Yeah. Um, but also it's just about regrouping and rebuilding. I, I mean, it's been really interesting for me. I moved back to Suffolk sort of two years ago from London, and I'm used to having that regular commute back and forward to London. And of course, I haven't seen any of my friends. So one of the first things I'm going to do is throw a party here in Suffolk for all my crazy friends. So um, neighbours, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> OK, so I hope to get an invite to that party. You know, you that, will. Obviously. <laughs> um, tell me about your time at Framlingham as a pupil, because that's something um, obviously that's, that's really important to everybody listening. Um, how did your time at Framlingham shape who you are today? Well, it's really extraordinary because lots of people don't believe this, but I was a shy boy. I was a quiet, retiring boy. And I think what, uh, and you know, it was Brandeston in those days and then on to Framlingham as a senior school. I think what was brilliant about it, and I would still argue this, it turns out really well-rounded people. And there was an emphasis when I was there, particularly on making sure that people excelled in whatever they were good at. It didn't necessarily have to be about academic training. In fact, I argue it went a bit the other way when I was there, and I know things have changed since then. But um, I think, it, you know, I was able to develop my love of music and drama and um, speaking. And at the same time, I was able to do other things that, that um, I was really into. I, I think we felt safe. I think we felt secure. And that's really important for uh, children and there was very good pastoral care and actually I'm still in contact with a couple of the teachers that taught me at, at Framlingham and in fact you know I emailed one of them yesterday so there was a great sort of sense of family of, of community and of kindness actually. You made um, a film a documentary about bullying didn't you um, a while ago now 
Was that in in some way connected to your time at school? Did you have a tough time or? Yeah, I mean, Framlingham was a very different place then to the school it is today. Um, I think many pupils will be shocked to hear that we had a communal changing room where we all changed together. We had bars um, and there was a lot of bullying that went on by older boys of younger boys in the school. I mean, things that just wouldn't be acceptable now. But it was sort of seen in that, you know, back in the day, that was how you toughened up. So, yes, I did um, that documentary for Newsround. It was a Newsround extra on bullying and it won a Royal Television Society Award for Best Children's Factual Programme. And the thing that I wanted children across the UK to understand is that actually, if you are being bullied, it's not you that has the problem. It's the bullies. And the most important thing that you can do as someone who is being bullied is to tell someone because we see all the time children who are bullied become insular, they don't tell anyone, and then they have serious mental health problems as a result. So a problem shared is a problem halved. If you're being bullied, tell someone, and that problem can be sorted. Now, that, that is really interesting to hear. And you know, things have, have moved on, as you say, an awful lot. And I think you know, we still have relationship issues between, between pupils, of course we do. I think a lot of it is now around social media, um, I wonder what your thoughts on are about social media, given that you are you work in the media so much now. Yeah, I mean, social media is the great sort of evil, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm judged in my job by how many followers I have, say, on Twitter. You know, I think I, I don't know what I've got now, 30,000. Um, and it, it has become a necessary evil. My worry, and particularly having nieces and nephews at the school who are young, is that I don't really want them involved in social media. I think as you're growing and developing, you need to decide who you are. What are your character traits? You know, what sort of person are you? And my worry is that by being constantly bombarded by Facebook, by Twitter, by advertising, you're constantly changing and reassessing yourself and, and trying to work out whether you have value. You know, if you're watching TikTok, if you're watching Instagram, these people are not real. They don't look like that. They've been edited. And my worry is, what does that do to your own uh, sort of sense of self-importance and how you feel, you know? And children are vulnerable and they need to be told they're loved and adored and they're fabulous in everything they do. So I think minimising social media would be a really good idea. Yeah, and I think it's schools working together with parents, isn't it, on that one to to bring the same messages to to the children. And we do an awful lot of that here, I'm pleased yes. to say. David, talk to me about the the sort of the path that you followed having finished at school and going to into medicine, because obviously you've had a plethora of <laughs> careers. Uh, talk, talk us through how that has uh, happened. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, I wanted from a very early age, I think, to be a farmer. And then after that, I wanted to be a doctor. So I went through school and did all those exams that were necessary to get into medical school. And I got into medical school and, um, and actually I struggled during my A-level years, but I did get the grades that I needed. There's a sort of side note on that, which is the grades then were lower than they are now. And I would argue that you don't necessarily have to be a great academic to be a doctor. You just have to have a good grasp of facts and a good brain that can assimilate it. And there is a slight difference in that. But anyway, so I went to med school, became a doctor, and then I was on a training rotation um, of very high powered hospitals in London. So this was St. Mary's and then the Hammersmith and Whittington hospitals doing general medicine, general surgery and emergency medicine. But I suppose the artistic side of me really felt that I didn't really have any sort of vent. Um, and I also was seeing people in clinics, clinic. so I was seeing fatter and fatter children in clinic who really had had no advice from their parents, they'd had no advice from their peers about what they could do. And as someone who was uh, overweight as a child, this had a really strong resonance for me. So I then realized that actually I could only see sort of 20 people in a clinic in a, t in a single time. But the medium of television meant that I could see far more. So to cut a very long story short, I had an idea I wrote to John Craven, who was then running Newsround, and I said, look, I think we should do children's health on television. No one does it. And John thought it was a brilliant idea, took me to the BBC, and I walked away with a three-day-a-month contract. And as a result, I resigned from my full-time job in the NHS, and at which point my mum thought I'd got a brain tumour because she thought I was absolutely insane. But for me, 
you have to do things that you're passionate about. And I wanted to do it. And what I decided was I'd give myself one year to see if I could make this work. I gave myself one year. I walked through the gates of Television Centre. And I think 23 years later, I'm still in broadcasting. And, and what about your time in the States? Um, because I, I've even noticed that you had a small part in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, only I'm not one movie. Go any further down that road. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about that. Uh, only one movie. I hasten to add. Yeah. So, um, so I had reached a stage. So I was really, you know, basically, I'm a great believer that belief creates reality. So I decided that my keys to the BBC Television Centre was I had to make the most of it. So I ran around that place and ended up on lots of different shows, doing Watchdog and Watchdog Health Check, which I wrote the BBC's primetime weekly health show on BBC One. And then I sort of reached a place in my career where I wasn't really getting the jobs that I should be getting. And, you know, these casting directors are really stupid because they, you know, if they need a, a, a host, they'll probably reach for one of five names that they can think of. And so my agent said, I think you need to go away to come back. And I said, well, where, where should I go? And she said, well, I think the Americans would find you very jolly. So I packed my bags and I went first of all to New York and I ended up working on a show called Rachel Ray. Now, Rachel was Oprah's cook um, and she had a huge following. And I ended up sort of reinventing myself as this rather ridiculous Brit um, telling off fat Americans and, you know, playing a role rather like Simon Cowell does in um, X Factor. And then from there, I auditioned um, and I really I could choose whether to live in New York or in Los Angeles. I love the sunshine. It was a no brainer. So I went to live in L.A. and ended up hosting a food competition show called Sugar Dome, which was completely over the top. And then auditioned for a Hollywood movie. And yes, I was in it. And it's an awful movie. And please don't Google it and don't watch it. <laughs> Too late. I've seen it. <laughs> I, you. I haven't dreadful. seen you. I couldn't see you in it, but I've seen a bit of it. Anyway, oh, okay. that's fascinating. And then after your time in the States, you then returned and carried on with, with your TV work here. And also in, in, in France, is there something going on there as well? Yeah, that's right. So um, I've also started a medical television channel which broadcasts to doctors around the world. So it's peer education. So the idea that once you're a doctor, you've sort of finished is, is not right. Doctors are continually training. So I then go to conferences around the world and then will assimilate and do television programs, say, with kidney specialists, with liver specialists, with respiratory specialists, so that other doctors can interact, ask questions, get experts together. And the studio for that is based in Paris. But fortunately, it's in English. I was going to ask you if you spoke French. <laughs> Ooh, la, la. I love the message there that you know, you're always learning. You know, we never stop. And I talk about that here at school with the teachers, all the staff. We're on that journey as much as the pupils. And, and if we ever decide that we've, we know it all, I think it's time to definitely come away from education. So that is really interesting. And I've now got to move to the, um, the side of you that has generated a lot of questions from uh, our audience, which is about politics and your mm. brief spell as an MEP. Yeah. Um, how did that feel? Just having that, it was, was it just a year and then that was it? It was less than that. I mean, let me explain why I got into it in the first place. I was on television talking about Brexit. The fact is, by the time I got involved, we'd already had the vote, the largest ever democratic vote in this country, with a resounding majority to leave, 52% to 48%. And yet the government wouldn't enact it. And I was getting really, really angry that the government wouldn't implement what the people had said. And that is the basis of democracy, the basis of British democracy. Um, and I happened to be talking to a number of people and they said, well, if you're so passionate, then you need to um, do something about it. And so I put my hat into the ring to become an MEP. Well, I then went on holiday and I was unpacking my suitcase and I was wearing a pair of boxer shorts. I was <laughs> unpacking my suitcase. That's too Nigel much information, <laughs> David. Too much uh, well, I was going to say, uh, but the irony of this is that on the phone was Nigel Farage who said, hello, David. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hi, Nigel. Um, and that's how it started. And I started campaigning, doing these massive rallies around the country to in football stadia to, to thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And I suddenly realized there was this terrible disconnect between Westminster and the rest of the country. And 
people joined the Brexit party. It was it was really cross party. So many of us came from all sorts. So from the right, from the left, from the center. But we were united in a common purpose. And that was that we had to see the, the wishes of the people carried out and blow me down. We then had the European election and I got elected and it was the most extraordinary time of my life. I ended up in Brussels in something that resembles the Starship Enterprise. I saw firsthand what the European Parliament is all about. And the more I was there, the more it cemented in my head the fact we had to leave. It is not, it is not a, an organisation I want anything to do with, and I can explain why. OK, so um, you mentioned Nigel Farage on the phone to you there. Is it, do you continue to stay in touch with him? Have you got him on speed dial? <laughs> I do, actually, yes. I speak to Nigel often. Um, at the moment with the coronavirus crisis, he rings me to find out what I think of what the government is doing in terms of the lockdown, what we should be. Uh, I mean, the Brexit party, we, we achieved what we wanted to do. And so we, we sort of retired. Um, I think the, the best way of explaining it is that we've probably been mothballed because, as you will know, we are uh, in the transition period, which ends at the uh, end of this year. Now, there are sort of moves within Whitehall to try to push that transition period. And if they do that, there will be trouble ahead. So I do talk to Nigel. Nigel often asks me medical questions about whether we should relax the lockdown. You know, we've been talking this morning. I did Jeremy Vine show. Um, we've been talking about should we be relaxing that lockdown? And that's the sort of advice I will give Nigel so that he can then go on and make a comment or a pithy a uh, witty retort to someone on the news. Do you think you'll ever go back into politics? Do you think that's something you'll return to? Um, the extraordinary thing about being a politician, and it's not something that I ever thought I was, um, is that you can have an enormous impact. And I suppose in many ways, um, being a member of parliament, and I'm not saying that's where I'm going, but um, being a member of parliament is very like being a, a GP, actually. Both have surgeries, both respond to letters from constituents or patients and both solve really important issues for those people. So um, I was already a candidate for the Conservative Party. That was back sort of 10 years ago. Um, would I do it again? Possibly. But politics is a very nasty business. Yeah. Um, the, um, the amount of abuse I got when I stood as an MEP was extraordinary. And I even had to have the police advising me on my security, even here in Suffolk. And that shows how low it's become. But it's important. And I enjoyed it. And of all the things that you've done, so media, being a politician, being a doctor, you, you must have seen all sides of human nature, I imagine, and learned a huge amount. Which of those three has taught you the most? All of them. I think what what I have really learned is that you have, a, particularly in television, I ended up with a lot of friends. But when push comes to shove, are they really your friends? And when the whole Brexit process happened, I'm a great believer that you should be friends with people regardless of their political persuasion. But what happened for me was I lost a whole swathe of friends and I realised actually they weren't my friends. So what I think I've seen through medicine is, is humanity, the fact, and we've seen this in coronavirus, the fact that people are caring for each other more. I think television is a means to an end. Um, I learn lessons every single day, and that's a really important point to take away. And one of the other things that, that gives me great energy is that I'm constantly reinventing myself. So I would be bored if I did the same job the whole time. So I don't. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the message that's coming through from you, that you know, you've, in everything you've done, you've pursued a passion that you've, you've had, something you felt strongly about, and you've pursued it. And, is that the the biggest lesson you'd want to share with the, the young people who are listening today, that that's the way to go, to follow those passions? Yeah, yeah. The, the most important lesson I can possibly say is if you believe strongly enough in something and if you fight hard enough for something, you can affect change. And when people say to you, no, you can't do it, that is a really good reason for you to do it. Fantastic. And I think on that note, David, I'm going to say thank you so much and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.